Good evening. Today is October 25th, Sunday evening, and we're continuing our study in world religions and major cults, and tonight we're going to begin our look at the Jehovah's Witnesses. And so we're going to follow the same sort of pattern that we've been following earlier. I'm going to give you some history and some quick facts in this session. Then next week I'll be giving you uh, beliefs, and that might take a week or two. And then I plan to conclude with a testimony from a Jehovah's Witness who has come to Christ. And so let's begin here and just um, give you an introduction here. Uh, in our study of cults, as we've come to the Jehovah's Witnesses, or they go by another name, the Watchtower Society, uh, we need to understand that basically the Jehovah's Witnesses are an end times revivalist cult. Um, and so they're focused on the end times and they have this revivalist background and mentality where they're opposed to or at odds with established religion. That's At least that's how they started. And um, so when we think about the Jehovah's Witnesses, we always must keep in mind that there's a huge part of what they believe that involves the end times. And uh, so we want to re remember that. Uh, the influence of the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Watchtower Society comes mainly through its publications and its door-to-door -door preaching, which is a requirement for its members. It's not just a requirement if they want to be a member in good standing. It's a requirement for them to be saved. So they have to do that door-to-door -door preaching. So uh, let's begin with some fast facts, some things that you may have already known, um, but so this will just be a reminder. Uh, the founder of this group was Charles Taze Russell. Charles Taze Russell. Um, essentially, it was founded in opposition to other organized religions. Uh, Charles Russell had this idea in his mind. Um, they are particularly marked out by the fact that they're non-Trinitarian. They do not believe in the Trinity. And in that sense, we would call them uh, Unitarians, where they just believe um, there's only God the Father. As I've already stated before, it's an end times cult. Uh, so all, all this focus that they have in their doctrine is basically going to be about the end times, but they have other things, obviously, that fit into that. It has a worldwide membership of close to 9 million. So when you think about other religions and, and maybe even other cults, it's not particularly um, that much larger or even the same size, as large as some of these other cults that we might be familiar with, but it's still a, a, a significant number of people. And, of course, they're known for their door-to-door -door preaching, and they'll come by in pairs, and they want to hand out their literature, and they want to talk to you a little bit, want to work you through one of their workbooks or take you through one of their workbooks and that type of thing, uh, which I'm sure uh, you're all familiar with as they've probably come to your door. Uh, also, they're known for their kingdom hall. So you'll see in many places... Um, a kingdom hall and they all pretty much look the same and these are all the meeting places for the Jehovah's Witnesses. Also we should um, just keep in mind that the society owns an eight-story uh, factory building in New York City uh, along with seven other factories here uh, scattered about. They own a farm to provide for their workers who work in their publishing uh, industry in New York City, and they own various other buildings and businesses, uh, many buildings around New York City itself, but they're involved in other things besides just what we think of as their religion. Um, interesting fact here that 63% of those raised as a Jehovah's Witness no longer claim affiliation. So they 63% of those who were raised in a home where the parents were Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, the children no longer claim to be connected to the, to the Jehovah's Witnesses 
at all. So that's a very high attrition rate. Um, so the, the ones who are raised in Jehovah's Witnesses, they are, they are leaving. They are leaving their religion in droves. But on the other side of things, 65% of Jehovah's Witnesses are converts. In other words, 65% of those who are in the Watchtower Society did not grow up in the home of Jehovah's Witnesses. They were, convert <coughs> excuse me, they were converted to it. Finally, the last thing to note is that they have their own translation of the Bible, and it's called the New World Translation. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that next week when we get into the beliefs. So these are just some of the facts to be aware of about Jehovah's Witnesses, so just some general information. Now I want to talk about the history. And as with any cult, when you talk about the history, you have to talk about the history of the founder. And so we're going to talk about that of uh, the history of Charles T. Russell here before we get into the history of uh, the, the church. They don't call themselves a church, the society. Um, and so we'll, we'll look at Charles Russell first, and then we'll look at the history of the society. Uh, Charles Russell was born February 16th, 1852. Now that date... Um, will become significant later when, I, when we get to the conclusion because he's born in the 1850s. And if you, you might remember that um, Joseph Smith of the Mormons was born about 35, 37 years before this. And, and so roughly Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses are, you know, their history has taken place at, pretty much the same time, um, uh, within a couple decades of one another. So that's, that'll be important to notice. Uh, Russell was raised in western Pennsylvania, and so he had a lot of dealings in Pennsylvania and New York. That sounds similar to Mormonism, too. Uh, but uh, western Pennsylvania is where he was, he was uh, raised. Early on, the doctrine of eternal torment, or the eternal damnation, was something that he had a problem with, and so he rejected it early in life. And so that's the doctrine that uh, for those who are saved, there's eternal blessedness, and those who are not saved, there's eternal uh, torment and damnation in the lake of fire. And so he rejects that. And so that'll be an important part of Jehovah's Witness doctrine uh, throughout its history. In 1870, he organized a little Bible study where he, of course, he's the leader, and it's not so much a study of the Bible as it is uh, giving Russell a venue to talk about his own personal belief system. In 1876, he becomes the pastor. He's elected the pastor of this uh, Bible class. Uh, they never call it a church but uh, he becomes the pastor, and that'll be a title that he has that's used over and over again, the pastor. And uh, so uh, now things are starting to become organized at, at this time. So 1876, things are starting to be uh, organized, and, and we'll see some of the things that happen here in the next few years. In uh, 1878, uh, Russell was the assistant editor of a periodical that uh, came out of Rochester, New York, and there was a conflict over the doctrine of the atonement, over Christ's atonement, and he was forced to resign. So he had to resign because of this, and he was out of step with what the Bible teaches about the atonement. And back then, uh, even, even in the, the mass publications of the day, you, you weren't going to be able to deny certain aspects of the atonement like Russell does. In eight, 1879, he marries Maria Akeley. Now, this is important because she, because she plays a very important role in the establishment and the early success of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And so she's integral to how fast the movement grows 
and, and just Russell's ability to be a proponent of his doctrines. Also in 1879, Russell establishes the periodical named the Herald of the Morning. And this periodical uh, becomes the Watchtower Announcing Jehovah's Kingdom. And basically, this is the first of Russell's uh, publications that, that comes out. And he, I think the first uh, run of this periodical ran something like 6,000 copies or something like that. But now um, it's up into the millions of, of copies that the Jehovah's Witnesses put out each month. But the very first one had about six, uh, 6,000 uh, copies that was produced. Now, as we get into the 1890s, there's some things that happen. The most significant thing is that Mrs. Russell leaves her husband. I'm not sure why she leaves, but she leaves in 1897, and then she sues for separation in 1906. So, again, I'm not sure what happened, but obviously there's a huge breach in the marriage. And then October 31st, uh, 1916, Russell dies. So unlike Joseph Smith, who is killed, Russell uh, dies a natural uh, death. Um, and when we consider who this man, Charles T. Russell, is, by all accounts, he was an egotist and a shyster. Um, we know from court records, he was involved in some court proceedings. He was sued. And even then, the, the court found that the society that he established was nothing more than a scheme to give him money and power. That's, in, that's what the courts uh, said about the Jehovah's Witnesses and about Russell at the very beginning. So... Uh, just like uh, Joseph Smith and the Mormons, Charles Russell and the Jehovah's Witnesses have pretty shady beginnings. Well, now let's go on and move to the history of the Watchtower. Now, when we talk about the Watchtower, uh, we have to be aware that the exact date that it was founded is, is kind of vague. Uh, we have seen that Russell began to organize in the 1870s, but it's probably not until the early 1880s, maybe 1880 or 1881, where he's really able to bring things together and really get a solid establishment of the Watchtower Society. However, once it gets established, it grows rapidly. In 1908, he moves it to Brooklyn, New York, the headquarters for the Jehovah's Witness, the Watchtower Society, is still in Brooklyn, New York to this day. So uh, they've been there for a very long time. In uh, 1917, after Russell's death, remember Russell died in 1916, after he died, there was a major split in the society. Again, we see the same type of thing with the Mormons. When you have an organization uh, or a movement that is surround that that surrounds the personality of one individual. When that individual is no longer on the scene, oftentimes there uh, ha there's a, a split in the organization, and that's exactly what we see with the Watchtower Society. Russell is no longer there. There's people who disagree with uh, some of the teachings they have, and so they split. And uh, into this comes Judge Joseph F. Rutherford, and he's the second leader of the Watchtower Society. He becomes the president in 1917. And the difference between um, Rutherford and Russell is pretty dramatic. Russell was, he did most of his um, propagation of, of the society through public speaking, whereas Russell really didn't make too many public appearances, but rather he wrote a tremendous amount. He published a tremendous amount in articles and books. I think one, one tally is close to 100 articles and books that he himself wrote and published. Um, and yeah, so it's about 100 books. And this is where 
uh, Rutherford expanded the society's influence. They would mail these things out. They would offer these things to people. And, and this is how they're getting people to join their group. Now, when Russell becomes the leader, he makes several organization, organizational and doctrinal changes. And we'll talk more about that when we get to what they believe. Um, and so you go from Russell to Rutherford, and um, they've had, I think, six leaders. I think I got that next. Yeah, so here's the leaders of the Jehovah's Witnesses, the leaders of the Watchtower Society. First, you have Russell from the founding up to 1916. Then you have Rutherford from 1917 to 1942 when he dies. Then you have Nathan Knorr from 1942 to 1977 when he dies. Then you had Frederick Franz from 1977 to 1992 when he dies. Then you have um, Milton Henschel from 1992 to 2000 when he dies, then you have Don Adams from 2000 to 19 or 2000 to 2014, and he didn't die; he stepped down. So Don Adams is the first leader who just steps down, and then you have Robert Saranko. I think that's how you pronounce his name, Saranko, who is the president right now from 2014 to the present. Uh, he is the leader of the Watchtower Society. And so this is just a brief history and a brief look at uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Watchtower Society. We'll get into more information about what they believe. And when we do that, I think you'll see how their history and uh, what they believe come together. And, and you'll start seeing who or what the society is today. Well, let me just mention some things here in conclusion. Much like Mormonism, the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, Charles Russell, was a man of questionable character and intention. Uh, Russell almost provides for us the definition of a cult leader. He's charismatic. He has an attractive personality. He's egotistical. He's manipulative. He's power-hungry. He's controlling, and he's seeking his own personal wealth and gain. In addition, we see that Russell opposed fundamental Christian truths. He, he opposed them, or either, either that, or he misunderstood them, or intentionally distorted them. Often, what he did was intentionally to distort these doctrines. And so, much like the other cults, the Jehovah's Witnesses will have their share of controversy outside the realm of religion. Uh, their controversy will boil over into the courts. And we saw that as well with the Mormons. And so here's some lessons that I think we can learn from the history of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Historically speaking, Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons are set in the larger context of the Second Great Awakening in the United States. Now, the Second Great Awakening happens from 1790 through 1840. And so while the Jehovah's Witnesses come after the Second Great Awakening, it, it, the Second Great Awakening forms the background that provides the fertile soil for the Jehovah's Witnesses to take root. Uh, both of these cults, Jehovah's Witness and Mormons, originated in about the same places, um, New York and Pennsylvania. And these places uh, were known for their emphasis on revivalism and revival meetings. So they were always interested to hear what somebody had to say about uh, some new religious talk or something like that. And so uh, they were very open to hearing anything anybody would have to say. And this presents a picture to us of the people, at least in this part of the United States, that had a great interest in spiritual things. Um, <coughs> excuse me. They had a great interest in spiritual things, but they were greatly misguided. 
their their zeal for spirituality allowed them to be open to all sorts of distortions and false doctrine. Uh, spiritually and biblically, uh, the people the people of the United States' readiness to follow non-mainline religions seems to indicate that at this time, so 18 in the middle of the 1800s, there seems to be a general dissatisfaction with what they were receiving at their churches. And so they were, they were so dissatisfied with what they uh, were getting or weren't getting at their churches that they were ready to try anything new that came down the pike, that came down the road. And so there was this spiritual vacuum, so to speak, that the churches were leaving. And this vacuum was just waiting to be filled by anyone who sounded remotely like they knew the Bible and was convinced of what they were saying. Uh, this spiritual instability uh, would lead us to conclude that by and large, most of the population who would have at least gone to church because that's what you do in their society but most of the population did not know or understand key doctrines of the Bible. If they would have known and understand key do stood key doctrines of the Bible, they would not have been so easily swayed by people like Charles Rutherford or uh, Joseph Smith. Um, and so we should be very cautious. When, oftentimes when we look back in history and we we tend to romanticize uh, how the United States was a Christian nation, but what we see from history itself, uh, for those who study history, we see that the United States, while it may have been religious, and it may have even, uh, you might have been even able to call it Christian in the sense that it followed certain Christian doctrines, most of the people in the United States at the time when the Jehovah's Witnesses were founded were not Bible believers. Um, and when you compare what was happening then to what is happening today, there's not a whole lot of difference. In the broader historical background of our church, there was a time that in our community where most of the people went to church. There was a time when most, many, if not most, of the people in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina went to church. And so let me ask you a question. How many people do you know who went to church 50 years ago and are still going to church today? Now, add to this question, how many of those people who are still going to church today, how many of their children and grandchildren are still going to church today. I guarantee you the number drops dramatically. But even with the decline in church attendance and church affiliation, which is a fact, there is an overwhelming spiritual need sensed by people, and they're trying to fill this spiritual need with all kinds of things. They try to fill them with causes, uh, with, with something they, that, that they can throw themselves into, some work, some cause. They try to fill it with relationships, with work, with play, and so on. Yet the spiritual hole in their lives continues to be there because the only thing that can fill it is true religion, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we today are very much in the same kind of setting that the United States was in when the Jehovah's Witnesses were founded and when they were becoming popular. Well, I hope this uh, helps you set the context of Jehovah's Witnesses. Like I said, next week we'll, we'll be talking about uh, their beliefs, particularly what is their authority and what did they say about Jesus Christ. So I hope you come back and join us then as we continue this study. And as always, uh, Pray that the Lord blesses you as you continue to live for him.